Welcome back to the Shade D Show. If you like what I'm doing, like, subscribe, please comment. And on this platform here, we only speak on the facts that once was and now what is. And sh shout out to my homie and to my peoples, M I Z Z O U. And I'm doing a reaction video on these goofy motherfuckers. Like, okay, I've been watching a lot of these videos on these people climbing these mountains and dying. Like, it's, it is ridiculous. Like, like they have this adrenaline, which I get it. Like, they want to conquer something. Like, it is an all of us to like do something but god damn it <laughs> climb a mountain where there's no oxygen and then I find out there was one dude that stayed on the Himalaya mountains for a day with no oxygen tank he's the only person like this shit is insane please look this up please look at this like this the, the shit that goes on on this earth is amazing but also to what the hell <laughs> let's get into it in 2023 already marking it as one of the deadliest years on the mountain over the last 50 years mm. the average death oh yeah shout out to Terra twin they're on you YouTube and um, this is where I'm getting all of this info from. <laughs> Look them up. Terror Twin on YouTube. The motherfuckers is something else, man. Alright, let's get back to it. Per year on Mount Everest is approximately five. We are more than double that number this year. With over 600 climbers reaching the summit, the number of climbers on the mountain continues to rise as the world views Everest as more of a tourist attraction. Hold on, hold on. Look at this shit. <laughs> I don't know what I said, get up smoke, but <laughs> ain't no side to side here. This shit is insane. This shit. This shit. These is, these is people. It's people. Till now, yeah, my shit's, I'm sorry, it's a, a touch. But yeah, that shit's the same though, right? But if you mess with the mountain. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. That shit is crazy. Like, you seeing all these people that want to climb mountains. Let's keep going. For return home. Two more families are stuck with the reality that their loved ones are not coming off the tallest peak in the world. This is their story. Trill around here. Mount Everest has an issue. There are simply too many people on the mountain at any one point in time, and we are seeing the effects of this. There is a record number of traffic, supplies, and human waste being left behind, and 13 climbers have lost their lives on the mountain this year. That's what I was just thinking about, watching all these videos. It's like, what's up with all the trash and the human waste? After all these years of all these people, Here, Nepal issued 478 permits to 47 teams, and with one and a half Sherpas assisting each climber, this is over 1,200 people on the mountain. A record number. This is mainly to uphold their economy as they rely heavily on the income generated by climbers willing to spend thousands to have a chance of reaching the tallest point on earth. Not only permit fees, but also the revenue generated for Sherpas, hotels, taxis, and vendors on the street. We can all agree that many of these people rely on the income from climbers and don't get me started on the pay of Sherpas. So it seems like a necessary evil, but what can we do to reduce the risk of the mountain? That dude that died. I was a Sherpa, which is a guide. And maybe more importantly, take care of Mother Nature. Well, there are initiatives to clean the mountains, such as the Nepal Army Mountain Cleanup Campaign. But we saw this year one of the Sherpas, a part of this initiative, sadly passed away on May 16th. The reality is that the permits are only increasing 
and this means more people who are not ready to climb Everest will be testing their luck, not only increasing the risk for themselves, but also those that are ready in trying to achieve a lifelong dream. Dr. Peter Swart was an anesthesiologist from Canada who was ready to fulfill his goal of reaching the highest point in the world. Peter, originally from South Africa, had started climbing at the age of nine and since then grew up with the desire of taking... These views are amazing, but I'm telling you, they have no oxygen at all. Not none. And on Everest, while Peter developed a love for climbing at an early age, he would take a back seat to his career and family. But after graduating medical school in South Africa, moving to Canada, creating a successful anesthesiology practice, oh. marrying the love of his life, Saritha, and becoming a father of two, he would once again find an unquenchable thirst to climb. After years of training, in 2019, at the age of 59, Peter would take on the tallest peak in North America, Denali. He would successfully summit the 6,190.5 meter peak and celebrate one of the greatest moments of his life. But the thirst would continue as Peter would move his sights to Everest. He would decide to make the trip to Everest with Madison Mountaineering. You may have heard the name once or twice if you have seen some of my other videos, as they are one of the most popular mountain services. Of course, Peter would be climbing up the southeast route through Nepal and be following the usual acclimatization schedule, which consisted of multiple trips on the mountain, each time reaching a higher point, spending some time at the higher altitude, and then descending back to base camp to rest. This photo, taken by legendary climber Garrett Madison, showed Peter on April 28th traversing through the Kumbu Icefall. That shit is crazy. Crazy. On one of these acclimatization trips, and on May 16th, Peter would post his own photo to his own Instagram of him once again no traversing the icefall for the final time, as they were beginning to make a summit push. The caption would read, Ice climbing in the Kumbu Icefall today. Perfect day. The climb up the mountain would be pretty standard, and the team would arrive at Camp 4 just under the death zone at 7,950 meters without incident. They would be preparing for the final summit push, and this is where the details get a little fuzzy. It is not. I'm glad I'm not showing this. This shit is stupid. They at the base of this shit. This shit look bad. It just, it just looks bad. It just Peter, looks bad. Peter did summit, but after entering the death zone, it looks he began bad. to develop a dry cough that others like would notice. Facts. And because of the altitude, he would quickly develop respiratory issues. We all know the dangers of the death zone, where the oxygen is a third of what it is at sea level. But trying to climb the world's tallest peak with respiratory issues? Well, it's not a good combo. Peter would have to descend the mountain, but his condition would only worsen to the point where his body could barely function. After traversing back to Camp 4 and on the descent to Camp 3 at 7,300 meters, just before reaching the safety of the tent, Peter's body could barely function. After traversing Camp 4, look at that shit. Camp 4 my ass. Back to Camp 4 and on the descent to Camp 3 at 7,300 meters, just before reaching the safety of the tents, Peter's body would unfortunately collapse. The 63 year old would pass away soon after. The outpour of support from family and friends would soon follow, with a colleague of Peter describing Peter's sense of humor was second to none. Laughing was always part of the encounter, and you always parted smiling. He was a trusted friend to many. I don't believe Peter's story is one of a climber not ready to take on Everest, but more so the unfortunate reality that you can prepare your entire life and sometimes Mother Nature just doesn't care. But Peter would die chasing a dream and there are a lot worse ways to go. It's everything you wish for. Your side traffic is skyrocketing until... This. Jason Kennison's story to reach Everest was vastly different from Peter. In fact, he was never even supposed to have made it to Everest. But the 40-year-old wanted to summit the world's tallest peak for charity after a disaster struck in 2006. 
Jason would be involved in a serious truck crash that would leave him with a broken leg, damaged shoulders, and after a routine operation, he would suffer from spinal cord damage. This would cause him to be stuck in a wheelchair. Doctors told him that he may never walk again, but Jason would begin rehab immediately, and within months, there would be a significant improvement in his condition. He would have to relearn how to walk, and that's exactly what he did. A year after his injury, he would return back to work in the mines, but it would take years before he was fully healed, and he never would be the same mentally. Well, I think Jason could describe it best. Looking back, it took a lot of my confidence, uh, my self-esteem, I think each injury that I had, and that really affected, I guess, made me a bit more insecure. He wanted to climb Everest, not only because it was a dream of his, but to show that he could, and to raise awareness around spinal cord injuries. Look, 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 I, I, look. How can I put this? Heads off to everyone trying to, to, bring awareness to something straight up from the top of my heart straight up but from the bottom of my heart why the fuck are you climbing Mount Everest it doesn't make any sense we all get that you trying to do what you need to do but that's going too far there's so many other places that you can run, can travel through, paddle to, through, climb to a certain point, but why in the hell? That's why that's what's coming from the bottom of my heart. Why in the hell are you going to the highest mountain to prove a point to the world about your call? There's other ways that you can do shit that doesn't require you to lose your life like this or test the limits like this. Let's get back to it. He should have never even made it to the mountain, but the fact that he did was an achievement within itself. In 2023, I will head to Nepal to see and be on Mount Everest, a long way from once battling traumatic injuries and the low and dark days of depression. An ambitious feat that I would never have dreamed of or thought was possible after once being told that I would not be able to walk. I'm going to make the most of my life and part of that involves helping other people who have had their life changed in an instant through spinal cord injury. They shouldn't be forgotten. They should be helped. That is like me. I am a gunshot victim. Like, I, I, I've been shot and shit, right? So... That's like me coming up with a cause, like for all the gunshot victims, I'ma go and climb a mountain. <laughs> for everybody that's been shot, I'ma go, cause just to make sure that everybody know what it's like, I'ma go, nigga no, nigga no, nigga, nigga no, that's all I'm saying. Jason would be climbing with Asian trekking and had prepared by setting up a ladder in his backyard to become comfortable with traversing on the rungs. He would also travel to New Zealand before the expedition to practice rock climbing and altitude climbing. Similar to our first story, Jason would have no issues acclimatizing to the mountain, and in late May there was predicted to be a clear weather window to which the group would finally prepare for the summit push. After making their way through the Kumbu Ice Fall and up the mountain to the various camps, Jason felt good. His body was strong from all the training Damn, and preparation. Sucks. I'm sorry, this video of Jason I didn't get shows that him just of above Camp 2, mm. making his way up the mountain. They would make it to Camp 4 just under the deck. But that knows that my shit worked out. Climbers get a small amount of rest before making the final push in the early hours of the morning. Jason would stand on the roof of the world on May 19th once again proving just how much grit and determination he had along with being an inspiration for so many but as we all know reaching the top of everest is only half the battle 
On the descent, Jason began showing some concerning symptoms, mainly around hallucination and confusion. To make matters worse, the two Sherpas that were with Jason were running out of oxygen canisters. Now it is unclear if they were out of oxygen because of a lack of planning, or if their pace was just too slow, but this would only spiral Jason's condition. And shortly after reaching the balcony, one of the more difficult areas on the mountain, Jason would begin to refuse to climb. He was suffering from high altitude cerebral edema, or HACE, a condition in which the brain swells from a lack of oxygen, causing irrational behaviors and thoughts, until ultimately the body begins to shut down. The two Sherpas would make the decision to return to Camp 4 ahead of Jason to retrieve more oxygen canisters before returning back to him. But because of a quick change in the weather while the Sherpas were at Camp 4, a climb back up to Jason was hold impossible. Hold on, hold on, hold on. It's, it sounds like the gods left him to go get oxygen to come back. If that was the case, why come he just didn't go with them? That's basically what they just said, right? Like the two people went and got oxygen, right? To bring it back to him. Why in the fuck did he didn't go? Or why come they didn't drag him? Unfortunately, Jason would collapse just above the balcony at 8,500 meters and would sadly take his final breath. Like most climbers who would sadly perish in the death zone, nobody would be able to retrieve Jason's body. A sad reality that all climbers must face forever being trapped above 8,000 meters. Jason's family would put out some touching comments with his mother remembering her final words to her son. And I said, well, just remember, Jason, please take it easy. Take care and remember, I'll always, I'll always love you. And that was the last words we said. It's hard to deny his accomplishments. And even Jason's brother, Adrian, would state he made it in high spirits doing what he wanted. There was the climb up, he had his photo on top of the summit. I do believe there's no denying that Jason achieved exactly what he wanted to. This season left many professionals on the outside fearful that we would have deja vu of 2019, with long lines of climbers seeking to reach the summit. But even with record numbers of climbers, we just didn't see this, mainly in part to the colder weather that sent a higher number of climbers home mid-season, many with a persistent virus that was traveling around camps. But the reality still remains that there are more... A virus that was traveling around camps people don't know what's been locked in that motherfucking ice that that shit's been there for a long time that shit that's been around there for a long time hammers on the mountain than ever before and with that comes risk there is no denying the rise in death making it one of the deadliest seasons in the mountain's history. But the question still remains, what is next for the king of all mountains? The next body that the motherfuckers gonna try to climb. <laughs> They're like, yep, got him right there. Who, who is that? That's Bill. That's... Plus... Something... P, maybe a Z, yeah, get, get him, get him. Alright, y'all, I'm done. If y'all like what I'm doing, like, subscribe, comment. I lost my mouse. But, uh, thank y'all for tuning in and haul.